The next item of business today is a member's business debate on motion number 247 in the name of Kate Forbes on rural communities and post-study work visa. The debate will be concluded without any questions being put. May I ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now, please. And I call Kate Forbes to open the debate. You have seven minutes, Ms Forbes. Thank you, presiding officer. I start by saying that I am a migrant and I have been one both individually and as part of a family. My family migrated to India twice, the first time when I was only a few months old and then again during my teens for a total of eight years. Individually, I've also been an economic migrant and have left the Highlands for several years to work and to study. And at a time when we're battling over the meaning of migration, a battle so fraught that I'm fearful it's shaping our constitutional future, at a time when migration is a word that has the dual power to break hearts as bodies are washed up on Mediterranean beaches and then harden hearts as faceless numbers are reported in the press. At a time when families in my own constituency like the Brains and the Zeldorfs are facing deportation. At a time like this, charged with complexity and confusion, I want to be very clear and simple in this debate. I have two points. Firstly, in rural communities like the Highlands, our greatest challenge is immigration. And secondly, of all the UK government's unhelpful changes to visas, scrapping the post-study work visa has been hugely detrimental to Scotland. Let me just start by sketching out the challenge we face in the Highlands, where we have fewer young people and a skills shortage. If the Highlands had the same demographic profile as the rest of Scotland, there would be an additional 18,000 young people between the ages of 15 and 30. And of the working age population, that's between 16 and 64 years old, 51% in my constituency of Skye, Lochaber and Badenoch are aged over 45. That's 10% higher than Scotland as a whole. And instead, many of our young people are leaving as economic migrants to pursue training and work opportunities elsewhere. I would. David I'm Stewart. Grateful. I'm very grateful for Kate Forbes giving way. I think she's made some excellent points. We should share my view that it's really important that the University of Highlands and Islands is able to recruit not just young people, but also international students from across the world. Kate I Forbes. Couldn't, I couldn't agree more, and I will come on to that in a minute. Employment figures are deceptive in the Highlands because unemployment is lower than for Scotland as a whole. The employment rate for my constituency is 83%, whereas in Scotland as a whole, it sits at 73%. That's impressive, but it's driven by a much higher dependence on part-time work. The skills shortage in the Highlands is acute, but it is also a challenge across Scotland. And according to the UK Commission for Employment and Skills, there's been a steep rise in job vacancies in Scotland since 2013, going from 54,000 in 2013 to 74,000 in 2015. And 34% of those are due to the lack of necessary skills in Scotland. And I don't need to spell out that skills shortages also have an impact on business productivity and growth. So why does the post-study work visa fit in here? Well, this is to make the case for the reintroduction of it as a way to meet the skills shortage demand. This is costing us. In Scotland, I believe that we are unanimously agreed on the need to reintroduce a new post-study work visa. All Scottish political parties, our colleges, our universities, our businesses, and even the Scottish Affairs Committee at Westminster are agreed that we need talented international graduates. Universities Scotland conservatively estimate that Scotland has lost about 254 million of revenue since 2012 as a direct result of the closure of the tier one post-study work visa for international graduates. But if the skills shortage and the population pressures are more acute in the Highlands, 
then so also is the need to reintroduce a new post-study work visa. Last week, for example, I had dinner with a fine family from India who have bought a wealth, brought a wealth of medical knowledge and experience to NHS Highland and whose son got five higher A's. We need them. A close friend in the Highlands is working as a dentist at a time we're in, when we're in short supply of dentists. But her husband still needs a visa to join her. We need them. Many of you will have seen the Brain family in the news, a family who have the skills we need, whose son is in the Gaelic primary, and who came to Scotland expecting to be able to stay on after studying on the post-study work visa. We need them. The Zeldorfs run the village store in Lagan, a very small community, and the family have been denied leave to stay by the UK government. We need them. We need all the international students who no longer apply to the University of the Highlands and Islands because there is no post-study work visa and it's easier for them to go to our competitors in Canada, the US and Germany. I just don't get it. I don't get why we're kicking out families when we need them in the rural areas of Scotland. Taking up the member's point on the University of Highlands and Islands, in 2012-2013, there were 26 full-time undergraduates from Nepal in the University of Highlands and Islands. This year, it's seven. In 2013-14, there were 61 full-time undergraduates from India. This year, it's 12. Universities Scotland have been quite clear that it's visa changes that have impacted on recruitment to the University of Highlands and Islands. India has previously been UHI's main market, and that was once the main international market for Scotland as a whole. The number of students applying from India since 2011-2012 has fallen by a whopping 57% and the number of students applying from Nigeria in the same period has reduced by 24%. This is at a time when our competitors in Canada, Germany and the United States, to name but a few, are reporting significant growth in international students. So in conclusion, our current visa arrangements are restrictive and off-putting and all of us are the poorer for it. I call Alexander Stewart. Speeches of four minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'd like to thank Kate Force for bringing this motion before the Chamber today. This is clearly a very important issue, and Ms Forbes has already indicated the background to the Brain family who are in part of her constituency. Uh, and it, they have had quite a, a high media profile uh, surrounding this, uh, and the current lack of post-study uh, visas in Scotland is, as I say, a very important issue that she raises. In the meantime, however, I am pleased to note that the Home Office have, in this case, uh, granted a further extension uh, to the Baines, because I think that is the, the right thing to do under their application, and they will remain with the United Kingdom. And I hope that there can be a satisfactory uh, solution to the conclusion for that family. It is indeed essential, Deputy Presiding Officer, that we act uh, and we attract people with skills and talent to Scotland. There is a broad consensus, Deputy Presiding Officer, of all the parties within this chamber that a dedicated post-study immigration route is essential. And I am very much in favour of that. Uh, I'd like to pay tribute to what happened in the previous parliamentary session, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, when my colleague Liz Smith uh, argued uh, from the Scottish uh, answer and a problem to be solved. And, and she has continually been uh, contacted by colleges and universities who are greatly concerned uh, about the end of the Tier 1 visa, which took place in uh, 2012. Liz sat on the cross-party group on post-study work visas and on behalf of the Conservative Unionist Party signed up to that, uh, uh, the recommendations that came, that the UK and the Scottish Government should work together to find a solution. And I still believe that is a very important way for us to go. Sh Surely? Alistair Allen. I, I thank the member for giving way and notwithstanding everything as he, he has just said, does he share my disappointment that the Secretary of State for Scotland has indicated that he has no intention of taking any of the issues that the Scottish Government has raised with him on this matter any further. Well, 
Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, I, I appreciate what you are saying, but there, there is still lobbying taking place, uh, and, and I will become part of that lobbying too, uh, along with Liz Smith and others, uh, because we do believe that there is some opportunity here. Uh, so it's important that we give him some information and try to move things forward, because, as I say, we think there is a case for it. As I've indicated, uh, Liz Smith has been talking to the Westminster colleagues, including the Home Secretary and the Secretary of State for Scotland, uh, to ask them to reconsider their position. And, and that's exactly what we're doing, Deputy Presiding Officer, at this stage. We must consider the demographics uh, of Scotland's population. Uh, we are markedly different uh, to uh, England. Uh, the population is projected to grow by 16% uh, in England uh, between 2012 and 2037. But they'll at the same time, there would be a 9% cut here in Scotland uh, for the same period, uh, and that causes concern uh, and alarm for us. Moreover, uh, the population of our working age population is forecast uh, to fall by 4% during that same time. So there will be gaps, uh, and these gaps need to, be fun, need to be filled, no question about that. As Ms Forbes highlights uh, in her motion, mm -hmm. this affects demographic issues, and particularly strongly in the rural community which she represents. It's very important that we also consider the issues when it comes to business and industry and what they're looking for and what they're trying to achieve. Talented individuals, uh, Deputy Presiding Officers, from overseas have the opportunity to come to Scotland uh, and they are aware and they, and they challenge and they have the opportunities to do that. And we must make sure that these cultural uh, transformers and business are there to do the best they can and fill the opportunities that we have here in Scotland. We are looking at all aspects. Our universities are leading the way in the cutting edge about what they can achieve. Many of the projects they're bringing forward are pioneering, and we must ensure that that takes place. In conclusion, presiding officer, we need to make decisions for the future of postgrad study visas, and it's very important that we look at all the facts. I hope that we can, within this chamber, uh, and the members across the chamber, work together within a cooperation of both the UK and the Scottish governments, seek a solution to the issue that is right for Scotland, that is right for the economy and right for our communities. Thank you very much indeed. I now call on David Stewart. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and could I start by congratulating my fellow Highlander, uh, Kate Forbes, on her success in securing this afternoon's debate and also her work in raising the constituency case of the Brain family. And I was very happy to add my name to the cross-party support for the Brain family to remain living and working in Scotland. I'd like to touch on the wider issues raised in the post-study work visa issue and touch on the specifics of the Brain case. As Universities uh, Scotland have said in their very helpful brief for today's debate, there's significant and respected evidence to back the economic, social and cultural benefits that Scotland would gain if the post-study work visa was to be reintroduced. But don't just take my word for it. Ask key universities, as has been pointed out by Kate Forbes already, ask Glasgow and ask Edinburgh, and the new kid on the block, UHI, um, ask the college sector, ask the student unions. But let me give you an example. Uh, a number of uh, years ago, uh, I visited Taiwan as part of the cross-party group in Taiwan. I met the British Council and I met universities. They made it very clear that in Taiwan, there's a very strong uh, background of students from schools going to universities and then studying abroad. They also then stayed on in the international destinations to work. Since the changes in the visa, the Taiwanese students coming to the UK has collapsed, which is extremely worrying. But our loss has been the gain, as other speakers have identified, in New Zealand, in Canada, Australia and America. And University of Scotland argue that there's a direct correlation between change in policy and student numbers falling off the cliff. If you look at Indian students, they're down 60%. Pakistani students down 46% and Nigerian students down 22%. And whilst demand is still relatively strong from China, the majority of universities in Scotland are not meeting their international recruitment targets. And as the NUS have said to the all-party group from the House of Commons Migration, that over half of international students see the option of working in the UK after study as a very attractive option. So what is the problem with the new UK Tier 2 route? Well, in my view, and echoed by other speakers, I believe, it's strict, it's bureaucratic, and it's unattractive to international graduates. The US, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand have a much more compelling visa offer to international students uh, who study there. 
And as the Westminster All-Party Group on Migration 2015 report, and I quote, presiding officer, the restricted nature of the tier two visa has prohibited some employers from being able to recruit skilled university graduates uh, under this route. So we know in Scotland, we have a great higher education product for international students. We exceed the uh, global um, benchmark for in, in international student satisfaction. There are very strong quality assurance mechanisms within our universities, and we've got world-class research. That's why I want the Brain family to stay and work in Scotland. They came here, as we heard, uh, on a student visa, but obviously the Home Office cancelled the scheme in 2012, forcing the family to apply for a tier two visa instead. And as Mr. Brain said to the national newspaper, and I quote, we are ready and able to contribute to the economy of the UK. The restrictions being imposed on us aren't coming from Brussels, they're coming directly from Westminster. For generations, presiding officer, Scots have left the nation of their birth to seek a new life in America, Canada and Australia and beyond. They have an enriched universities, industry and the political process. All we ask is that the Brain Act family be given their chance to enrich their adopted country, and I ask the government to think again on the restrictive and anti-competitive Tier 2 policy. I now call the last of the open speeches, and that's Stuart Stevenson. Mr Stevenson. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer, and let me add my congratulations to the, that of others to Kate Forbes in obtaining time for this debate. And, and let me also thank uh, uh, my work placement student for the week, uh, Daisy Collins, who has done the research and written the notes, which I will use uh, during my uh, contribution. Uh, Scotland uh, has been greatly enhanced by the diversity that comes with immigration, uh, those from different nations who freely come uh, to build their lives here in Scotland. And it's hard to imagine any area of human activity that hasn't benefited from that input economically, politically, socially, and culturally in our classrooms and our surgeries elsewhere, across our towns and rural villages, and in particular in remote areas of Scotland. The endeavors of different peoples from different backgrounds are evident to us all and continue to be overwhelmingly uh, positive. But the current rules that we've all been talking about imposed by Westminster uh, are driven by the needs of another area in this island, the populous, some might say overpopulous, uh, parts of the South. And I think uh, certain parts of the Conservative Party uh, have rather cynically taken the opportunity to use immigration uh, to pander to other agendas, which has resulted in backward-looking immigration rules that help no one whatsoever, utterly failing uh, to reflect the stark uh, divide that exists in our needs between Scotland and the rest of the UK, and indeed almost certainly disadvantaged certain areas in England as well. That's to the detriment of our economy, education system, and rural communities in particular that are the focus uh, of the motion before us. And it's for that reason uh, that I support the motion to restate the post-study work, uh, uh, post work reason. We need a fair and robust system, one that's sensitive and intelligent, and designed to support the requirements of all the countries of the UK. Uh, when in 2012 the coalition government decided to scrap the visa, uh, our potential as a nation uh, was fantastically weakened and all our futures uh, affected by that. Um, if we continue to su support and uh, allow uh, barriers that are unnecessary, we all suffer short term and long term. We miss out in the enormous gene pool uh, that comes from international students. And of course, in particular, uh, it has a direct and very personal effect on the Brain family and other families. Uh, this is a bankrupt policy whose time has come to for abolition. Uh, we are losing a well of talent. Uh, we want to accept people here who, who will train us, who will develop in our society. Uh, otherwise, we get a brain drain. We've heard uh, from a number of contributors about the effect uh, on international students coming to Scotland and the uh, counter-attractions that come from other nations. And that is an economic impact as well as a practical and moral impact. The decline of international students is very much to be regretted. 
and historically we've seen emigration from our rural communities and the, this doesn't help. My family, like others, is represented in Canada, in the United States, in Australia, in New Zealand, in Sweden, in Denmark, and in other places, odd places even like the Lebanon. If we stop people coming here, the odds are we'll find it will be more difficult for our people to travel, and that helps uh, no one. Uh, we've got to strengthen and enhance our economy and cultural diversity. This policy doesn't help us. The long-term effects of this are obvious and depressing. It's time that we use this as one of the levers uh, to tackle depopulation of our rural communities. We need a sensible post-work visa system. The current arrangements simply don't work. Presiding officer. I now call Alistair Allen to respond to this debate. You have seven minutes, please, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. <coughs> my apologies, firstly, that uh, I am still struggling through a cold and uh, uh, you, my voice may run out halfway. <laughs> I thank uh, Kate Forbes for tabling this uh, motion and for her fine speech. Uh, and I'm pleased to be called to represent the Scottish Government in closing this debate today. This debate has not only been about one very compelling case, that of the Brain family, who are, as we've heard, desperate to secure a future in the Scottish Highlands, but rather it is also about the broader, equally compelling case for a, a fair and managed immigration system that meets Scotland's specific social, economic and cultural needs. I'm pleased again to see a, a broad cross-party support in the Chamber for the principle of the reintroduction of a post-study work visa, which we have seen many times expressed before. Uh, and I assure Ms Forbes that this is something that the Scottish Government is committed to continue to push the UK Government to deliver. I also welcome, as have others in this debate, the Home Office decision to allow the Brain family to stay until August, and I hope that they are able to take this opportunity to find a UK visa route which meets their needs and allows them to remain in the community that they clearly call home. But that, and I must say this uncharacteristic compassion from the Home Office at this point, does not help others who find themselves in the same situation as the Brain family. And make no mistake, the Brain family is not the only compelling immigration case. And as has been alluded to by others, there will be many other families uh, in equally difficult circumstances across Scotland. The fact is that uh, if there was a reasonable post-study work option for international graduates, as the Scottish Government has been pushing for since the UK Government announced the closure of the previous route in 2011, if we had been listened to and a post-study work route was in place, then we wouldn't be here talking about this today. The Brain family, Catherine, Greg and Lachlan, would be happily carrying on the life they have built for themselves in Dingwall. Catherine would have had two years after she graduated in which to further develop her skills in the workplace, gain experience and move into graduate level employment, which with luck might have met the UK government's UK wide income requirements. As it is, under current UK immigration rules, uh, international graduates do not have two years in which to find graduate level employment. They have a maximum of four months. Four months from graduation to find a job which pays at the very minimum £20,800, depending on the job and the sector they uh, hope to work in, uh, this level could be much higher. Now, four months clearly is not an adequate period for international graduates to transition between education and skilled employment. And this is not a new issue. This is not the first time I have stood here in this chamber and called for the UK Government to listen to Scotland's specific needs and introduce an effective post-study work visa. The Scottish Government has evidenced and argued and evidenced again the case for a post-study work route to allow international graduates to remain and work in Scotland and for specific uh, Scottish-specific immigration flexibilities. I stood here last year as Minister for Learning, Science and Scotland's Languages and I argued the case for a post-study work visa. I welcomed uh, the cross-party support for post-study work. I offered the evidence gathered by leaders across our education and business sectors and I called on the UK Government to honour the commitment in the Smith Report to discuss the potential for the reintroduction of a post-study work route for Scotland. 
Now, at that debate, Liz Smith said it would be to Scotland's detriment if we did not sort this issue out and uh, that the Smith Commission provided us with an opportunity to do so. Well, with respect, and I appreciate the sentiments that have been expressed here today from the Conservative and other benches, but with respect, I'm sorry to say to Liz Smith that we are still waiting on the UK Government, uh, which has so far failed to honour that commitment. Following that debate, my predecessor, Hamza Youssef, set up a cross-party steering group on post-study work, which included representatives of all the major political parties in Scotland, as well as representatives for education, student and business interests. That steering group... I will, yes. Can I first, of all, may I first of all apologise for being a, a little late into this? I had another uh, commitment. Um, Minister, uh, the uh, situation is as follows, that the Secretary of State for Scotland has, has until July the 23rd to reply uh, to the Westminster, the Scottish Affairs Committee report. So there is still a window of possibility of getting a Scottish solution to this. Um, and can I give him a guarantee that we are still in discussion with the Secretary of State for Scotland to press the issue? Alistair Allen. Well, I very much uh, appreciate the tone of that. I, I hope that the, the window is, is being uh, pushed vigorously because uh, certainly, uh, as far as I'm concerned, the, the statements to date from the Secretary of Scotland have been very far from encouraging on this point. But as I say, uh, I welcome uh, the comments from Liz Smith that she intends to, to change minds in Westminster on these issues. Uh, following the, the debate, as I said, uh, my predecessor was uh, involved in uh, many of these issues uh, and the steering group uh, published their findings on the 3rd of March this year. Uh, that report again concluded that the flexible post-study work group would benefit Scotland. This report was sent to the UK Minister for Immigration, James Brokenshire, uh, and he advises me he is still considering its contents. So, if I can conclude, Presiding Officer, I want to say again uh, that the Brain family uh, are clearly not the only family to be unfairly caught out by the UK Government's increasingly restrictive immigration rules. Uh, and the removal of the post-study work group is not the only issue I have with the UK Government immigration system. I offer my sympathy to all of those who wish to live in Scotland and contribute to our economy, culture and society but who have been stymied by the UK government's increasingly restrictive rules. And I call again on the UK government to honour the recommendation in the Smith report to discuss with the Scottish government the possibility of a post-study work route. I have already written to Mr Brokenshire asking for a meeting to discuss this issue and await his response. I again conclude by thanking Ms Forbes for tabling this debate and I hope uh, that uh, next year we are here again but discussing the success of the new post-study work group, we have won for Scotland. Uh, and I would also like to wish the Brain family every success with their own visa application. I now suspend this meeting until half past two.